we should probably talk about what loudness actually is. There's a big difference between measuring loud on a meter and sounding loud. And in the previous video, we talked about the three M's of mastering. These are the three foundational concepts that I think you have to have a, a grip on and an understanding of if you want success with the rest of the mastering process. And they were, of course, monitoring, metering and mindset. In this video, I'm going to start talking to you about the processing chain, the actual sequence of processing that I use when I'm mastering. And it might surprise you to find that it's a lot simpler than you might think. Uh, there are actually only three main plugins that I use on the majority of the projects that I master. They are EQ, compression and limiting. And we're going to look at each of them in turn. Of course, I do use other processing as needed, but those three between them probably account for, I'm guessing, 80 to 90 percent of the mastering processing that I normally do. Actually, that's not strictly true. There is a fourth plugin. Um, it's very, very simple, though, and it's simply a gain plugin or a trim plugin. It allows you to set the level of the music before you apply any other processing. And that's crucial because of something that I call the loudness deception. It's the fact that our brains perceive more treble and bass in louder sounds. Nobody knows quite why this is. Perhaps it's because, evolutionarily speaking, uh, it's more important to pay attention to the saber-toothed tiger that's breathing down your neck than the one that's over there stalking a herd of gazelles. So our brain makes sounds that are closer seem more exciting and important to us. Nobody really knows, but it is a fact that I've demonstrated often to even a room full of people. You play them two pieces of music or audio that are exactly the same, but one of them is maybe a dB louder. People hear them as sounding different in all kinds of ways, and lots of them prefer the louder version. And that's actually the root of the loudness wars. But what it means is it's crucial to get the level right before we make any other mastering decisions. If you imagine if you don't, let's say you apply some EQ to try and balance the tone of the track that you're working on, but then you lift up the level because you decide that it's not quite loud enough, the change in level will change the way that we hear the EQ and mean that the decisions you made before aren't quite right. So it's really important to get the level right before you make any other decisions. Otherwise, you waste time and end up going around in circles. So we know that loudness is important, but we should probably talk about what loudness actually is. There's a big difference between measuring loud on a meter and sounding loud. For example, if you record somebody singing softly and then turn them up, it will measure loud. The sound is at a high level, but we still know that it's a quiet sound. And in the same way, if you record something like an explosion, but turn it down, we still know that it's a loud sound, even though it's quiet. And that's why I think there's a lot of confusion. Lots of people are making things louder than they need to in the quest to measure loud, but not realizing that that probably wasn't necessary in order to sound loud in the first place. Sounding loud is a lot more to do with production decisions and processing and the mix and the arrangement than it is the raw loudness level. Now, measuring loudness is actually surprisingly tricky. Uh, the good news is we have some new meters these days that uh, make it much more straightforward, and certainly they're a standard so that you know that your music will be judged in the same way wherever it gets played back. But I think the best way to describe this to you is to show you. So, Let's jump into WaveLab and take a look at some of the different types of metering that are available for measuring loudness. And the most well-known is unfortunately also the least useful, and that's the good old peak level meter that we have on the output of pretty much every piece of music software. And it tracks the 
maximum peak level of the audio waveform. Um, but unfortunately, it's not very useful for judging loudness. I'll show you what I mean by that. I mean, if we just look at these two example sounds here, we have a synth sound and a snare sound, both taken from the song Another Day Calling. It's one of the examples that I'm using in this video series. And you can immediately see that the peak level on that snare sound is much higher than the synth sound. In fact, it's so high it looks like it's probably going to deafen us. So we'll start by turning it down a bit, maybe 3 dBs, and let's just measure the peak loudness of those two files and compare them. So minus 12.8 is the maximum peak level of that synth sound, and the snare minus 4.72. Now, already that snare doesn't actually sound very loud in comparison to that uh, synth, but according to the peak level, to match the loudness, if that's how we were trying to decide it, we would need to turn the snare down by, what, another 8 dBs. So 3 plus, that's uh, minus 11. Let's try that. So minus 12.68, that's nearly minus 12.8. So now let's listen to those two sounds one after another. I think you know what the result is going to be. The snare sounds puny in comparison, and that's not surprising, because drum sounds are percussive in nature. They have a big spike at the beginning, and the body of the tone, the ring of the drum, is at a much lower level by comparison. So peak levels aren't a great way to assess loudness. There are other methods of measuring loudness, though, and the most recent, and in my opinion probably the best, is the loudness unit, or LU. You often hear about LUFS, loudness units full scale, so loudness units in comparison to the zero level on the meters. LUFS are an updated version of RMS, effectively, that try and take into account the different sensitivities of our ears to different frequency ranges. So they take into account the fact that our ears are more sensitive in the upper mid-range, for example, and less sensitive to bass. One of the big problems with an RMS meter is that bassy signals can give higher readings than perhaps we might expect from listening to the audio. So let's try matching these sounds using LUFS instead. If I play the synth sound... You can see the loudness meter over here measures the integrated loudness, that's the overall loudness of that sound, as minus 25 LUFS. Let's try the snare sound. So the overall integrated loudness of that is minus 32 LUFS. So let's adjust the gain and listen again to both of those, matched this time using the LUFS loudness measurement instead of peak. It's really hard to say with such different sounds whether those loudness values are perfectly matched or not, but I think we can certainly say they're a lot closer than they were when we used the peak level to match them, and that's really the point I'm making here. As I say, in my experience, LUFS is really pretty good. There's also another method of measuring loudness, which is my own personal preference, which I'll show you in a minute. But the question you're probably asking is, well, okay, we know how to measure loudness, how loud should we make the music? And this is one of the key questions that you have to decide if you're going to be mastering music. If we look at a few fairly random examples, this is Chandelier by Sia, which has an overall integrated loudness of minus 5.2 LUFS, whereas this is Numa by Tool, which measures minus 11.8 LUFS overall. Now you might say that's just the difference between two different genres or perhaps two different levels of mass audience. But then when you compare with Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson, which is also mastered at relatively conservative levels but still managed to be a massive worldwide hit, it measures minus 10 LUFS overall, you see that that theory doesn't stack up either. So the question is, how loud should you master? Should it be minus 5? Should it be minus 12? Should it be minus 16? How do you decide this? And I basically have two suggestions. The first is simply to use reference tracks that you're happy with. So here are some reference tracks that I've added in Wavelab. And by the way, here's another 
indication that peak level is a really bad way to judge loudness. This is Chandelier by Sia. This is Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson. And as we just saw, there's 5 dBs difference of loudness between those two, but you'd be hard pressed to tell from the waveforms. Using a reference track like this is pretty straightforward. You basically just flick in between uh, the reference track and the thing you're working on to make sure that you're happy with the way that they match up. The disadvantage is that it can be really challenging to achieve these kind of loudness levels without making significant compromises to the way the music sounds. Making things sound super loud and okay is very challenging. Making things sound great and super loud is arguably not possible, depending on your point of view. And I think you have to ask yourself whether the effort is worth it in the 21st century, when everything is going to get adjusted in level by streaming services, the question is whether you would be better off making use of all of the extra peak headroom that could be available to you and mastering at a slightly lower level. That's not to say you shouldn't do this, but personally whenever I see something that's being turned down dramatically by normalisation online, I at least want to do the experiment. And the second suggestion is to use the method that I personally use when I'm mastering, which is to adjust the loudest sections of the song that you're working on to a standard level or close to a standard level that you have chosen that you think sounds great, and then balance the rest of the sections of the song musically in comparison to that. And I'm going to show you how that works with these three example songs. And I'm also going to show you the other method of measuring loudness that I like, and that's to use an emulated VU meter. I'm using here the Klanghelm VUMT, which is a fantastic affordable plugin that I recommend everybody gets hold of. VU meters were originally analog needle meters using a moving coil, and they show something that's similar to RMS, but not quite the same. Like RMS, they're very sensitive to bass, so you have to be careful when you're interpreting the results that they give. And the results can be a little bit quirky, but the thing that I really like about them is the way that the information is displayed. You can see here that rather than the 96 dB of range that we have on a peak meter or on a loudness meter, the range here is only 23 dBs from the bottom to the top of the scale. And once you've calibrated your VU meter so that the level you want sits around the zero mark, that means that the meter is very sensitive if you move away from that goal. So for example, if your song is only 2 or 3 dBs louder than you want it to be at the zero value, the meters are going to peg, they're going to be flat out. And similarly, if the level is 3 dBs or more below the level that you're aiming for, again, the needles are going to be right down at the bottom of the scale here, so it's most sensitive around the zero region and that makes it really useful for matching levels to that kind of target. Now again, of course, I'm not saying you should choose your levels by eye. The meters are a useful guideline, a useful starting point, and over time you need to learn how what you hear corresponds with what you see and figure out the best way for you to use them. But I really like using VU meters, and you'll see that they give broadly similar results to the RMS and loudness meters as well. Now you could set your chosen loudness reference level to whatever you like, but the value that I'm going to suggest to you is minus 11. You'll see most of VU meters come out of the box, or <laughs> out of the virtual wrapper if you like, calibrated to minus 18, which is a good value to use if you're mixing, or if you're sending music out to analog gear, or if you're using analog gear and want to maintain optimal gain staging. It avoids the risk of running gear or emulations of analog gear too hot. But for mastering, I'd suggest something higher, and minus 11 is that number. Now you'll see I've adjusted the clip level on these two tracks. That's mainly because I like to see big full-bodied waveforms. It doesn't really matter where you adjust the gain or how you do it, but let's play a little bit of these songs and see what they're registering. So you can see the VU meter there is hovering around the minus two mark. So I'm going to add an extra little gain utility to the clip, just this one clip here, and add 2 dB. Let's take a listen. Love, 
and you can see the needles are now hovering around the zero level, pushing up to plus one sometimes. That may still be a little bit on the hot side, but it's okay for the time being. Next we'll move to Widow. Looks to me like that one could probably do with something like 3 dBs of gain. As I say, you can add this gain anywhere you like. I prefer to do it as a separate process from any other processing. Lots of plugins like compressors and EQ allow you to add gain as well as the other processing. I suggest you avoid that because remember the loudness deception. As soon as you bypass an EQ plugin that also lifts the level by 2 dBs, you can't really trust the before and after comparison of the EQ. EQ is tricky anyway, because if you have big boosts in there, that can actually lift the loudness anyway. But let's avoid making it any worse by adding gain boosts there. So I suggest you add the gain as a separate part of the process first, like this. Play your needs, respect. I know man, but you play Probably a little bit hot. I should probably mention at this stage that I do have a limiter on the output. Let's see what it's doing. It looks like it's working fairly hard already. going to come back and talk about limiting and compression in a later episode. For the time being, this is just to stop the tracks clipping on the output. So that's those two fairly straightforward examples done. We can tell from the peak waveform that Another Day Calling is going to be a bit less straightforward because it obviously gets much louder at the end. So let's start by listening to that and seeing what the levels measure. Again, it looks like there's two or three dBs extra gain that we can have. We've got room to add a little bit there. And then let's maybe put in another dB here. Possibly we can have a little bit more. I can hear that I'm going to want to make some changes to the EQ of this song, which we're going to look at in the next video. Right now the goal is just to get these kind of in the right ballpark so that we're not being fooled by any loudness deception when we start to make the EQ choices in the next video. <laughs> Let's compare that with the louder sections of the other songs. All of these values are going to get tweaked as we adjust the other processing, as you're going to see in the later videos. Let's go with that for now. Now, the next question is, is this quieter section here going to be musically appropriate? Let's take a listen. I think that's probably going to turn out to be too quiet. The problem is, if we increase the level of this song, the end is going to be way over the top. It won't actually clip because modern DAWs use something called floating point processing, and the final limiter will control the peak levels. 
but it will be hitting that limiter very, very hard. So I'm going to try and experiment. I have a hunch that this song might benefit from a very gentle rebalancing of the levels. If we add some automation here, we can increase the level of the earlier section of the song, and then it will decrease very slowly. So it's just kind of moving against the decisions that Mike has made in the mix there. I mean, you might already know I'm a big fan of dynamics, but I'm a big fan of balanced dynamics, of effective dynamics. And my instinct, just listening to that verse compared to the end, is that the contrast currently is too much. So let's just see how this sounds at this level. Just guess the value there. I'm happy with that. We'll listen to this transition in a minute. Let's just go into listen to the very beginning of the song. I think that works. It might be a little bit loud. It's difficult to tell. I can hear there are some adjustments that I want to make to the EQ of this song. In particular, I want to warm it up quite a bit, uh, and that will affect the way that we perceive the loudness. So we may well tweak this uh, this decision here. But let's just take a quick listen to this transition section here and make sure that we haven't completely robbed this, this build in uh, loudness here of its impact. Nope, it's still got plenty of drama and, and power in that build. In fact, there may be some sections there where it's even still a little bit too much. We'll see. Um, I'm thinking we're going to be using some gentle compression, uh, which again we're going to cover in a later video. And that may change the way. At the moment it's hitting the limiter a bit hard, so all of this stuff is going to be revised. But stage one is now complete. We have the three songs at more or less balanced loudness. I've used my recommendation of minus 11. And by the way, let's just look. If you don't want to use a VU meter, you can also use the short-term loudness. We use the integrated loudness, LUFS value, the overall value, when we were balancing those examples earlier on in the video. But that's not how I recommend you balance the loudness of whole songs. Even after we've made this adjustment of the sections in Another Day Calling, I didn't push the early section of the song up as loud as the end. So we can pretty much guarantee that because only the final section of the song is as loud as the other two, the overall value for this song is going to come out 
as lower. If we try and match the overall loudness of this level with these two, in my experience it's going to sound much too loud, because it has more varied dynamics throughout its running time. So instead what I suggest you do is look at the short term loudness at the loudest moment. So let's just run through that. If we play the end of Promises and Lies. You can see that's it's loud. It's minus nine LUFS. It may be too loud. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to tweak it now before I forget. Let's try aiming for minus ten. Yeah, I'm more comfortable with that. Let's try widow. That's also feeling quite loud, but we'll leave it there for now. And now let's look at the end of Another Day Calling. So they're all on the loud side. My suggestion is that the loudest section should be minus 10 LUFS, no louder. But Next, we're going to be looking at the EQ balance of these songs, and that will affect the way that we hear the loudness, and we will be tweaking these values. So this is the starting point that I would suggest, and you're going to see how that evolves through the rest of the mastering process. And the last point I want to make is that I've suggested calibrating a VU meter to minus 11, having a short-term loudness of minus 10 at the loudest moments. You're free to choose whatever loudness values you would like. If the music you would like your masters to sound like comes from the late 80s, early 90s, then the loudest sections might be at minus 14 or minus 16 LUFS. If you're aiming for that 20th century loudness war sound, then you may want to aim much louder. Whichever method you choose, either matching a reference track or setting your own personal benchmark, Deciding how loud to master your songs is a key decision to make very early in the mastering process, because the loudness influences the way that the songs sound, and that influences all the other decisions we make along the way. So hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of how you might want to decide how loud to master your music, and how to measure it at least. But of course, it's not just about the measurements, it's all about how it sounds. And there's one further step that you need to take. Once you've decided how loud you're going to master, and you've chosen your mastering reference level in terms of the meters, you need to set your mastering monitoring level. How loud does it sound to you when it gets played back? And my suggestion for that is pretty simple. Uh, you need to take your reference track, whatever it is, make sure it's playing at the right loudness, you're using my recommendations that the loudest moments are at minus 10 LUFS or thereabouts, play it back and listen to it and adjust the gain on your amp or your mixer or your monitoring controller so that you're hearing it good and loud but not so loud that it's exhausting, that it it gives you a headache or makes you feel fatigued. It wants to feel exciting. Uh, it wants to, when it's loud, you, you want to feel the energy, you want to feel it in the room, but you don't want it to exhaust you. It might take you a little bit of time to get that right because uh, it's a personal preference for everybody and you it depends to some extent on the music that you're working on. So don't worry if you don't get it right straight away. If you find that you're constantly wanting to push the music a little bit louder, you probably don't have your level quite high enough. And if you find that the meters are always looking a bit low, but it sounds loud in the room, or you're starting to get um, a headache or uh, ringing in your ears or something terrible like that, probably means that the monitoring level is a little bit loud. Once you've found that level, then you are going to find that incredibly valuable over time. Uh, you will start to develop an instinct. By listening to lots of music, you'll know immediately when you pull something in, whether it's mastered loud, whether it's mastered quiet, you will start to hear subtle differences more easily. You'll start to notice differences in EQ, differences in compression, and it's an amazingly simple step, but it's an amazingly powerful step that you can take as you start to improve your mastering skills. So 
We've decided on the mastering level. We've decided on our mastering monitoring level. We've chosen our loudness meters and how we're going to assess the loudness. The next stage is to start working on the sound of the music. Having set the level correctly, we now know we're hearing the EQ accurately so we can make great decisions about what the EQ balance should be. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next video. If you've been finding these videos helpful, I think you'll also love a free PDF that I've put together. It's called The Home Mastering Guide, and you can get your copy at homemasteringguide.com. It's completely free, it's just a simple PDF, and it talks you through the six essential steps to releasing your music with complete confidence. I think it makes a great companion to these videos, and you'll find it really helpful. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel here to make sure you see all the other videos in this series, plus the other great content that Sound on Sound are putting out. My name is Ian Shepherd. Thanks for listening. Thank you.